Welcome, Climate Viewers. This is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News with Facts Minus Fear Porn, here to do a presentation about ionospheric heaters, space weather control, and geophysical warfare. This is going to be a pretty informative presentation. I've spent about a week on it, and I have a lot of references to go through. Let's get started right now. So, as you can see, uh, we've got the HARP facility here and the Aurorasaurus behind it. This presentation is free of charge, is uh, public domain, and you are free to download it and distribute it to anyone you like. So, I hope that you will do that. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. What is an ionospheric heater? It's a powerful high frequency transmitter, two to 10 megahertz, that induces controlled temporary modification to electron temperature at a desired altitude. So it changes the temperature of the sky. What is an ionospheric heater and what's not an ionospheric heater? Now on the left hand side, you can see Right here, this is a Harold Holt uh, Naval Station. It is a VLF transmission site. It directly transmits low frequencies. Whereas on the right hand side, we have the HARP facility, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, which uses high frequency waves to cook the sky and create low frequency waves. So that's one of the main differences is that it doesn't actually transmit low frequencies. It uses the sky to create them. This is my ionospheric uh, heater map. You can find it at climateviewer.org or if you are on the presentation, you can click directly on the image. It'll take you there. And here are the top four ionospheric heaters in the world. Of course, we've already mentioned HARP. There's the Tr Tromso ionospheric he heater in Norway. The Arecibo Observatory Enhanced High Frequency Ionospheric Heating Instrument. Oh my goodness, that's a mouthful. In uh, Arecibo, Puerto Rico. And the Sura Ionospheric Heating Facility in Russia. And here is a map of not just the ionospheric heaters, but many of the other instruments that are used uh, with the ionospheric heaters in addition to missile defense radars. Uh, lasers and direct energy uh, sites, ionosons, super darn, and the ELF VLF transmitters themselves. Uh, so check that out. All of that's available at Climate Viewer 3D at climateviewer.org/3D. Why heat the ionosphere? Fear. Use it, it, uh, the sky as a laboratory without walls. I just uploaded this video from the AMS 98th Annual Meeting. Converting the ionosphere in, into a laboratory without walls. Active ionospheric research with HARP. Uh, you could check that video out on my YouTube channel. And the, here's the full list that we're going to go through of why they heat the ionosphere. Space weather control. Terrestrial weather modification, climate control, space warfare, radiation belt remediation and artificial aurora, create extremely and ultra low frequency waves, sig to signal the apocalypse by talking to submarines, artificial gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances, mind control or EMF health effects. Create artificial ionospheric mirrors to reflect radio signals. The laser developed atmospheric lens, which is the next generation of the artificial ionospheric mirror, to probe underground structures and possibly create artificial earthquakes. So what's the definition of space weather control? Scientific experiments to control conditions in the region of space close to the Earth, especially the presence of electromagnetic radiation and charged particles emitted by the sun that can affect human activity and technology. Uh, Lyndon Johnson said, From space, the masters of infinity would have the power to control Earth's weather, to cause drought and flood, to change the tides and raise the levels of the sea, to divert the Gulf Stream, and change temperate climates to frigid. That's some scary stuff. So let's do a little bit of history after he said that. 
Upper atmospheric nuclear explosions like Operation Argus, Hardtack, Starfish Prime, and the Russians are Operation K, where they were detonating nuclear um, missiles in space to see what kind of effects they had on the radiation belts and the Van Allen belts. And what we found out was they actually created new radiation belts or artificial radiation belts. Project Westford, the needles, where 480 million copper dipole antennas were launched into orbit. You can see one on the tip of that guy's finger right there. And basically, this was an idea of creating an artificial ionosphere. Uh, it was a very embarrassing experiment. The first launch was unsuccessful, and the second launch uh, dumped all those needles. They're still in space today, and a whole bunch of them are in the North Pole. In 1963, plasma seeding with sounding rockets and satellites began. Why? Because of the limited test ban treaty, because they banned upper atmospheric nuclear explosions. So they immediately went to using satellites and rockets to dump chemicals in space to create artificial ion clouds. Here's examples of what the sounding rockets look like. Um, going left to right, we have a trimethyl aluminum uh, trail here. We have a lithium trail here, which is visible during the daylight. This one was launched July 2013, so they're still in use today. And right here is what a barium cloud looks like. And you can see it's the purplish color here and the trimethyl aluminum same time and you can see it trailing in the upper atmospheric winds and on the far right here we have the charged aerosol release experiment uh, or care where they were trying to create artificial noctilucent clouds and they were heating them with the haystack radar um in uh the MIT University, uh, so that's what, how they work. They, they dump these chemicals, they heat them with a the microwave. And then here's the same kind of deal uh, with a satellite. It was called the Combined Release and Radiation Effects Satellite. And it was dumping chemicals in space and the Arecibo ionospheric heater um, was checking out those signals and bouncing radio waves off those metals. Um, on the far right, we have a military document, multiple instrument studies of chemical releases and heating at Arecibo, and the chemicals that were released by the CRES satellite, barium, strontium, lithium, calcium, and sulfur hexafluoride, AKA the banned um, CO, or the banned greenhouse gas, that is so naughty. Um, this uh, led to the military trying to, you know, figure out what are the legal logistics of screwing with space. So they had a paper titled "International Treaties and Active Experiments in Space," and this is da uh, dated September first, nineteen eighty-nine, and it says. Experiments involving detonation of nuclear devices or interference with foreign space assets, especially national technical means to verification, are explicitly forbidden. In pl planned these experiments, in planned these experiments, great care must be exerted so they are produce no widespread, long-lasting, or severe effects on the environment. And the reason why is that's the exact terminology from the NMOD or the Environmental Modification Convention Weather Warfare Ban. So they don't want to, you know, violate NMOD. And they said one of the reasons why they would do this is an ability to reduce trapped radiation would increase orbit selection options for future space-based surveillance systems. So suck radiation out of space so they can put more satellites at a lower altitude to spy on you. Department of Defense creates HARP, 1989 to 1990. And this is uh, what's called the Joint Services Program Plans and Activities. And they had the workshop on ionospheric modification and generation of extremely low frequency waves. 
And here's the dates and times of all the meetings that were held between NASA or uh, the U.S. Naval Research Lab, the Air Force Geophysics Lab, um, DARPA, and the Department of Defense. So this is definitely, you know, it started out as a military project. Then they got HARP uh, built, and you can actually see it underway being built on the right. In 1994, it became operational with 960 kilowatts worth of power. And by 2006, it was operating at full capacity with 180 towers, 72 feet tall, 80 feet apart, and 3,600,000 watts going into it. Here's a infographic I did combining the th you know the three together. You have the sounding rockets, you have the satellites spraying up there, you have the HARP facility, which is one, two, and three. So one is HARP uh, firing its uh, charged particle beams into the sky, creating artificial um, ionospheric mirror up there in the thermosphere above 150 kilometers, um, artificial aurora being created, air glow being created, all in one picture. In addition, the noctilucent clouds. So this is the, the question that everybody has and everybody always asks, can heart mess with the weather? And I've been able to find a couple references that I think you might find fascinating. This is uh, from February 2001, my good buddy Dominic Graham over at Weather Modification History just recently found this article. And it says, in the late 70s, experiments were performed from Ukraine using three 1,000 kilowatt or one megawatt transmitters in parallel. The antenna consisted of 13 vertical towers in the shape of a parabola with various folded dipoles strung between the towers. It also had a very narrow bandwidth, approximately three megahertz, which is similar to HARP. HARP is two to 10 megahertz. And a very narrow beam width, approximately five to 10 degrees. As a result, the gain that they obtained from this antenna was a staggering 38 decibels. Yowza. What did it do? It burned a hole in the ionosphere. Quote, but instead of creating a solid area of reflection, the, the artificial ionospheric mirror, they discovered they were actually burning a hole in the ionosphere and the signal was being shot off into space. They also noticed that the area of the ionospheric hole had an effect on approaching weather fronts. The weather fronts were being deflected around the ionospheric heated area. Inadvertent weather modification. So it was an accident that they modified the weather, allegedly. But regardless, that's some pretty smoking gun stuff there uh, that burning a hole in the ionosphere can deflect weather fronts. Now we're on to the Russian woodpecker, which is also located in Ukraine. So the Russian woodpecker signals were detected from as early as the 70s, like was mentioned in the last article. Um, and they continued all the way to 1989. Uh, but most people don't know that the Duga 3 radar at Chernobyl was directly connected to the Chernobyl reactor. So what was this thing up to? What's a woodpecker? Well, it was known as the woodpecker because it made this pecking signal, you know, that could be he heard worldwide. In an article titled, Is ELF Able to Manipulate the Weather from Popular Communications, June 1984, has a technique devised by Tesla permitted the Soviets to alter the world's weather. And these are quotes from this article. They are phenomenal. Last Christmas, the low temperature records in 21 states and 60 cities were broken, caused the deaths of 138 persons, and damaged many millions of dollars worth of crops. While this was going on, December in Europe was unseasonably warm. El Nino popped up unexpectedly off the shore off and off schedule in 1982 and 
Dr. Andrew Mitrowski, Canadian State Department, said, In the case of the winter of 1976 and 77, the Soviets managed to establish, establish terrestrial electrical resonance and then learned how to establish relatively stable and localized ELF magnetic fields, which were able to hamper or divert the jet stream flow in Northern Hemisphere. He further stated, as the columnar waves rotated clockwise, the westerly winds were sucked upwards counterclockwise into the upper atmosphere, while a drag brought air from the upper atmosphere on the other side. Dr. Mitrowski postulates that the Soviet ELF signals are pulses on a frequency of 31.5 hertz. That's a very low, that's extremely low frequency, ELF and have caused giant standing wave troughs in the Rocky Mountains between Alberta and New Mexico and another trough through the eastern United States. Dr. Walter Orr Roberts, Aspen Institute of Colorado said, the idea of changing the conductivity of the atmosphere as a weather modification experiment is not ridiculous. Al Bielek, American electrical engineer discussed that the Soviets had been experimenting with these signals on a particular frequency, but it was only after a change to 31.5 hertz that El Nino's strange activity began to be observed. The Washington Post in 1983 reported that El, the El Nino was the worst it had been in a hundred years and that equatorial trade winds blowing from east to west stalled. That's some pretty smoking gun stuff as well. So this is all related to the Russian woodpecker. What may also be related to the Russian woodpecker is the Chernobyl meltdown. So the, all of what I just described to you happened in 1982 and 1983. In 1986, reactor four from the Chernobyl site melted down. That effectively cut the power to the Russian woodpecker in uh, Ukraine and that put a real hamper on their ability to continue doing this so was this you know military warfare you know striking back or was it just a nuclear accident you be the judge dr um dr rick shankman on mit's website um cited some of my research and said could these HARP activities be the reason for troubling anomalies in our climate data and modeling? Anomalies capitalized upon by climate denying interests in their fight against climate activists and concerned scientists? And he's referring to the global warming pause. Could punching holes in the ionosphere be the reason why there is a pause in global temperatures that have existed since 1997? Uh, about the time HARP came online and started doing its uh, work. You be the judge on that. Another climate control experiment, Project Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds, where they talked about laser atmospheric methane cloud detection, energization, and methane destruction by using tr transmitters like HARP to squeeze methane in the atmosphere into diamonds to create to generate sunshine reflecting noctilucent clouds in increasing amounts in the mesosphere which will reflect the sun's energy back into space quote noctilucent clouds formed from the breakdown of methane in a circular zone above the harp transmitter four other similar facilities around the world high pass which is now closed, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, Icecat, Norway, and Sura, Russia, where they could immediately attack atmospheric methane as well. And this was by uh, Malcolm P.R. Light from the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, AMEG. So, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Jack Anderson, superhero reporter, wrote, the race for the for Star Wars weapons. Now, I originally found this on the CIA's website, and it says declassified in part. It was originally posted in the Washington Post. 
So I find it ironic that they had to classify part of something that used to be in a newspaper and then release it on their FOIA section on CIA.gov. But regardless, overall the US and USSR high energy laser programs are roughly equal at present. This is 1981. Charged particle beam devices or CPBs represent a new phase in the historical development of technology, the study reports. When perfected, these controlled lightning bolts can solve a wide range of scientific and industrial problems, the report states, but it adds ominously, Soviet work on controlled particle beams is strong in exactly the areas needed for weapons applications. It is believed that the Soviets are ahead of the U.S. in many other particle beam weapon technologies. Because they've been at it much longer than the U.S. and they you know, have obviously been operating. They had something called the Tesla Howitzer back in the day. So why is this all important? Well, it's important because of space warfare. And as you can see here, here are three types of space warfare currently um, in use. Kamikaze satellites, uh, where they are literally designed to just run into the other military satellite and blow it up. Hijacker satellites, which have like an arm that can come over and grab another uh, country's satellite and move it out of orbit, throw it out of orbit, um, attach sensors to it so they can spy on it, or disabling them with lasers or laser blinding satellites, which China just did. How China tried to blind U.S. satellites using high-powered lasers from the ground. So this is, uh, this is pretty serious, and in case you didn't know, that's why Trump made the Space Force, because as he put it, space, it's where it's at. Radiation belt remediation. So now we're getting into what HARP can do and why. Christophilos effect could fry satellites and intercontinental ballistic missiles. The Christophilos effect was first discovered during the Operation Argus, Hardtag, Starfish Prime, and Operation K by a guy named Nicholas Christophilos. And what he d found out was that radiation would get trapped in the, in the uh, magnetic fields or the magnetosphere, the Van Allen belts, and would bounce from pole to pole. It would create artificial radiation belts. And these actually would fry satellites. So it was postulated that this could be used as a missile defense system by charging the atmosphere and any nuclear uh, warheads or intercontinental ballistic missiles flying through that charged sphere would explode or have their guidance systems fried from EMP. Can't make this stuff up. So that led to Dennis Papadopoulos and the satellite threat due to high altitude nuclear detonations where they posed to the government creating HARP as quote a wind tunnel to determine the feasibility and engineering specifications of a mitigation system for high altitude EMP or solar flares like the Carrington event. So the idea was with radiation belt remediation that they could very quickly suck radiation out of space and create artificial aurora because that's what normally happens with aurora borealis. You know, when we have a, a massive solar flare coming our way, we get increased aurora activity because that, you know, charged particles rain down on the poles and that creates all the pretty lights. Well, they want to be able to create that artificially. And that was one of the reasons why HARP got its initial funding. And this is from uh, Chris Fallen over, he's the director of HARP currently. Art the artificial aurora, properly called radio-enhanced air glow, occurs at an approximate altitude of 150 to 300 kilometers and can be photographed, conditions permitting, from distances several hundreds of kilometers from HARP, including near the main population centers of Alaska, Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau. 
The Harp artificial aurora is usually not sufficiently luminous to be seen with the unaided eye except under exceptional conditions and even the best case uh, it it is as bright though much smaller in appearance than the Andromeda galaxy. So this is a Google um, KML file that he provided with a view from Fairbanks of what it would look like in the sky where you would see the artificial aurora. And this is a shot from space where I zoomed out directly above HARP. And HARP is located on a magnetic field line. So that's why the line is in the direction that it is. That's where HARP signals would shoot out. So he has it color coded for how strong they would be, I imagine. This is what air glow looks like from space. And this is a shot of an actual air glow experiment where they put harp into a circular motion and they spin it around um, and they can create you know artificial air glow directly above the transmitter so that's an example of that extremely low frequency waves creating elf from high frequency transmissions so there's two ways that harp um, can create ELF, extremely low frequency waves, and ultra low frequency wa waves. The first is called polar electrojet antenna. And what it's using is it's using the auroral electrojet and attenuating it to create a signal. So they're actually firing electricity into the auroral electrojet, which is where we commonly see um, aurora. And it says, Find an electrojet region, place an ionospheric heater, HARP, use the heater to modulate it at ELF VLF and get the mod frequency that makes a polar electrojet antenna. Here's another shot of it right here. This shows the E region, auroral or equatorial electrojet current. It shows ELF and VLF um, less than 20 kilohertz being shot off into space and radiated ELF signals related to the power of the high frequency transmitter coming down towards earth. So they can create uh, frequencies from 20 kilohertz down to um, anywhere like 0.001 hertz uh, using this method. But it is, you know, you have to be in the area. That's why Tromso Norway is an ionospheric heater. That's why a lot of these poker flats up here uh, Resolute Bay, um, the uh, AMISR that's up there, they're all up here because that's how they work. They use the Aurora Electrojet as a virtual antenna in the sky. But then they figured out another way to do it, and that's called ionospheric current drive. And this can be used not only at the North and South Pole, but it can be used right along the equator. Both high latitude and equatorial ionospheric heaters may use an alternate method to produce ULF, ELF waves that does not require an electrojet. By heating the F layer, 150 to 800 kilometers of the ionosphere, magnetosonic waves are created are created in a secondary Alvin wave generator in the E region. These Alvin waves travel upwards and follow the Van Allen belts hopping back and forth. So they heat it all the way up here, 300 kilometers in this chart. Magnetosonic waves, which are very, very low frequency vibrations, actually heat up the E layer, which is around 100 kilometers, which then create Alvin waves which then create the ELF waves. Boy, that's complicated, but hey, they figured it out. Does not require an electrojet, can be implemented anywhere, anytime. And that is why they decided to put ionospheric heaters on boats. And they sold the heart facility. So that led to mobile ionospheric heaters on boats. And as you can see here, Implications for a barge or shipboard option, they call it the straw man high frequency array. Gotta love that, straw man. The irony. Um, so they can 
provide theater and strategic sub communications, submarine communications. Optimal area for mobile array along magnetic equator, green band within two degrees of dip equator. You can see the green line right here, and it shows optimal region for alpha array right here um, off the coast of China and uh, you know South Korea. Gotta love it. So now harps on boats. Yay. So why, why would they put harp on a boat? Why are they making these ELF waves to talk to submarines, um, among other things? And I blew up the little diagram they have here. So they've got their harp on a boat and it's sending radio frequency waves up into the F region of the um, equatorial ionosphere and magnetosphere. Some of that is a waveguide ELF like we showed in the picture that comes down low. Some of it is shot off into space and comes back down. Magnetosonic ELF in the ionosphere, all of which can reach under the ocean and talk to um, submarines. And the reason they want to do this is because it's called preemptive nuclear strike. So ELF waves are sent to submarines telling them to surface so they can receive radio frequency or laser based instructions, AKA launch codes and targets from military commanders. These instructions will not reach underwater. However, ELF and ULF waves reach the bottom of the ocean. And that is what is called first strike or counter force. So signaling the apocalypse. Uh, that's what ELF waves in the military have in common. In addition, uh, ELF waves uh, can be used to create artificial gravity waves or traveling ionospheric disturbances. And you can see here a couple of quotes, results of our ionospheric heating experiments to generate artificial acoustic gravity waves and traveling ionosphere disturbances, which were conducted at the high frequency active rural research program, Hart facility in Gakona, Alaska. The result of our experiments indicate that artificial AGWTID can be generated in the ionosphere by means of modulated high frequency heating. And here's some pictures of how they did it and a couple papers on the topic. So extremely low frequency waves and mind control influencing the nervous systems by electrical methods. Extremely low frequency waves, ELF waves up to 100 Hertz are once more naturally occurring, but they can also be produced artificially such as the Navy's Project Sanguine for submarine communication. ELF waves are not normally noticed by unaided senses, yet their resonant effects on the human body have been connected with both physiological disorders and emotional distortion. That is from a military paper called From PSYOP to Mind War, The Psychology of Victory, talking about the, the health effects of ELF waves. The Russian parliament, concerned about U.S. plans to develop a new weapon, said that the HARP program could, quote, have a negative impact on the mental health of people populating entire regions. And I've got a nice little chart over here on the side showing uh, ELF at 30 to 300 hertz and ULF at 3 to 30 hertz, although there are signals even below 3 hertz, as we will see before the end of this video. So, Snuffing the Schumann resonance. Schumann resonances are the heartbeat of this planet, and a lot of them are created by lightning, but it is believed that the nervous systems in almost all life on planet Earth, including our brains, developed as a um, function of, in response to, the Schumann resonances. These are resonant frequencies in the ionosphere. 7.83 being the strongest one, 14, 20, 26, 33, 39, and 45 hertz. The resonant frequency of the planet Earth, which is 10 hertz, as Nikola Tesla discovered. Damaging this planetary heartbeat could be detrimental to all life on the planet. So what did I find? Dennis Papadopoulos, University of Maryland. 
Spectrum before Harp ULF start experiment. Ambient noise. Schumann resonance right there. After uh, the Harp uh, experiment starts, Spectrum after Harp ULF start noise increase by more than 10 to 20 decibels between 0.7 to 10 hertz. So that 7.83 hertz bump you see right there is gone and it's replaced with a spike at 60 hertz like the signal and the power in the wall um, of your house gotta hate that so they can actually erase the schumann resonance by attenuating the ionosphere however elf and ulf produced by harp may have effects on emf sensitive individuals like myself and unknown effects on all life forms on Earth due to the interaction and interruption of the Schumann resonances, but currently, HARP cannot control your mind, like tell you to do things, like go kill somebody or go kill yourself. Um, it can and likely does have an effect on your nervous system because we are all connected to that signal, whether we like it or not. It is a good thing. Creating artificial ionospheric mirrors, heating plasma to reflect radio signals. So on the right hand side we have US patent 5,041,834 and this is a patent owned by BAE Systems and I basically labeled the drawing here so you can see what's going on. This is the heart facility, this is the artificial ionospheric mirror. This is a transmitter and it's reflecting a signal off of it to a receiver. This is a tracking radar, which is bouncing radio waves off the ionosphere to track a plane over here and bouncing radio waves off of the ionospheric mirror to track a plane over here. So it is a reflective surface. It is actually uh, a plasma fireball in space. It is a controlled plasma fireball basically. Um, and then over here is an even more sciencey version from, once again, Dennis Papadopoulos, University of Maryland's presentation showing, you know, different uh, aspects of what the, um, the artificial ionospheric mirror is. And he shows the MUIR radar at the heart facility, um, you know, passing a signal through it. So interesting stuff indeed. So interesting that BAE Systems took it to the next level. And they caught, came up with what's called the Laser Developed Atmospheric Lens. So now, instead of just reflecting signals, they can fi fly a space plane or drone and use lasers to create that artificial mirror or lens in the space. The device would use high powered pulse lasers to create a lens by manipulating the Earth's atmosphere through reversible heating or ionization. So it's an ionospheric heater in space that uses a laser. And basically this allows them to spy on citizens in unprecedented detail like this. So this is from their own promotional video and allow them to view battlefield more effectively from long distances to collect vital information. So is it an artificial mirror or is it an artificial lens? It is, it is probably one and the same. The scary thing about this is that the Nazis tried to make something called the sun gun or the burning lens. And if you can make a lens in space, you can focus the energy of the sun on a particular target as well. That is a very scary thought indeed. Probing underground structures. This is from the U.S. military once more, Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, imaging of underground structure using HARP. Non-invasive imaging of underground structure is important for the detection of hidden tunnels or other hazards as well as resource exploration, mineral exploration, and environmental contamination problems. 
the Harb transmitter has the potential to be a valuable exploration tool in that it could generate electromagnetic fields that appear appeared locally as plane waves and could overcome the problems with low AMT signal levels and geologic noise. So by plucking the strings of harp, the magnetic field lines, and firing uh, electromagnetic signals into the ground, they could look underground. Like so. Pentagon scientists target Iran's nuclear mole men. This is from Wired Magazine. Some years ago, military-backed scientists at Alaska's High Frequency Active Rural Research Program were able to map out tunnels at depths of 100 feet or greater. Papadopoulos, yeah, that guy, Dennis Papadopoulos, for example, says he wants to do another round of subterranean surveillance experiments. Quote, personally, I believe it can reach around 1,000 kilometers. It currently can't reach Iran, if that's your question, one of those researchers, Dennis Papadopoulos, told Danger Room. But if I put harp on a ship <laughs> or on an oil platform, who knows? And as we know, that is exactly what they did and what his plans were. So we've covered that already. They are putting them on ships, and that explains a lot. Uh, being able to fire ELF and VLF into the ground to look for, you know, nuclear uh, bases, nuclear caves, uh, North Korea's under mountain, um, you know, nuclear experiments. That's what they're up to, which leads us to the scary part, creating artificial earthquakes. Others are engaging even in an eco type of terrorism whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. This is a quote. So there are plenty of ingenious minds out there that out there that are at work finding ways in which they can wreak terror upon other nations. It's real. And that's the reason why we have to intensify our efforts. And that's why it is so important. That was Secretary of Defense William Cohen speaking at the Terrorism, Weapons of Mass Destruction, and U.S. Strategy at the Sam Nunn Policy Forum in April 28, 1997, shortly after HARP was operational. Coincidence, I think not. Which brings us to the meat and potatoes. The Fukushima Daiichi meltdown and the magnet, magnitude 9 earthquake. Article titled, Atmosphere Above Japan Heated Rapidly Before the Magnitude 9 Earthquake. Dimitar Ozunov at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Sorry for butchering your name. I'm Southern. In Maryland and a few... Uh, buddies present the data from the Great Tohoku Earthquake, which devastated Japan on 11 March 2011. Their results, although preliminary, are eye-opening. They state that before the magnitude 9 earthquake, the total electron content of the ionosphere increased dramatically over the epicenter, reaching a maximum three days before the quake struck. And as you can see here, the blue areas are the heating. And you can see they got a chart going all the way up to red. So on the 8th, it got a nice blue circle going on there. The 9th, it kind of dissipated. On the 10th, it got bright red. And on the 11th, that's when we had our earthquake. Um, and it continued on the 12th, the day after. Um, pretty creepy stuff. So why is this important? Well... HARP was active during that time. Um, when this happened, the U.S. Air Force had not sold the HARP facility, and they had something there called the HARP Induction Magnetometer. And what it did was it would be able to pick up signals between 0 and 5 hertz. And there was 
many conspiracies, you know, floating out there about this, but this is no longer really a conspiracy. This 2.5 hertz signal that you're seeing right here is the harp signal that was active March 11, 2011, right before the quake. And this is the quake going off right in this area. So there has to be some correlation here because this 2.5 hertz signal uh, was active for days before, just like was shown here. Um, everybody was watching it, you know, I, I personally watched it daily at the time. Um, and we've saved these images just for such occasion. They took the magnetometer offline shortly after the earthquake hit. And it was off for weeks. And since they've sold the heart facility to the University of Alaska, they took their magnetometer with them. So it's no longer even there. But regardless, um, there was a lot of debate about where this 2.5 hertz signal was coming from. And on a prominent uh, website, uh, signals below 22 kilohertz, uh, they had this, the, the 0.25, uh, presumed but not yet verified as man-made signal detected at various locations worldwide with amateur equipment. It is not easy to determine eventual frequency shifts, so signal is listed as a 2.5 hertz carrier. So far, the signal is not connected with any known geophysical events, most likely not originating from HARP, Kokona, Alaska. They have little success with the generation of ELF signals of reasonable strength over anything than relative short distances. This was dated February 23, 2002. Once again, Dennis Papadopoulos provides the evidence the Demeter satellite detecting shear Alvin waves generated by HARP at 2.5 hertz. And you can see it right here, 2.5 off this chart, goes right off the top of it. And right here, here's another one, Gakona, Alaska, 2.5 hertz right there. So HARP has the ability to create a 2.5 hertz tone. It was seen during the earthquake so that leads us to the question which came first did the earth shifting and fracturing heat the ionosphere before the earthquake or did an ionospheric heater heat the ionosphere which caused the earthquake this is a question that will probably never be answered because they are now using this preheating of the ionosphere to predict earthquakes um, so I, you know, I'm still, you know, debating this myself, you know, if the ionosphere was heated before the earthquake and there are things called ionospheric heaters, you do the math. I don't know. You tell me. So that's the presentation. There's way more I could put into this because there are many more experiments that happened during the history of weather modification, uh, space weather modification that I did not cover in this. So I do got, hope you guys will come over to um, weathermodificationhistory.com, the world's most comprehensive weather control archive with hundreds of verified historical facts, images, and videos. Um, and check out the Star Wars section over there. That'll be all of the space weather modification stuff. You can simply click the link in this presentation. Also check out Harp in the Sky Heaters on Climate Viewer News. Articles on ionospheric heaters on Climate Viewer News. And the Atmospheric Sensors and EMF Sites section on Climate Viewer 3D. The map to see all of these facilities. Um, so that's my three websites, Climate Viewer News, Climate Viewer 3D, and WeatherModificationHistory.com. I hope you guys will check it out. There's links to the social media below on that as well. Um, and I hope that you will subscribe. Um, I'm on YouTube at Jim Lee Climate Viewer. So if you search YouTube for Jim Lee Climate Viewer, 
Uh, you'll check out my um, channel, which is now up to like 14,500 subscribers. I appreciate you guys tuning in. And I mirror all my videos to BitTube and Twitch TV. Uh, just so that there's a backup in case Google ever gets mad enough at me to kick me off like they have done so many other people. Um, now, all of this research you just saw was free of charge. Uh, this uh, presentation is open source, public domain, and you can download it and send it anywhere. So I truly hope that you guys will continue to support my research. Um, you can do that by joining as a Patreon at patreon.com slash climate viewer or giving a one-time donation at paypal.me slash climate viewer or gofundme.com slash climate viewer. Uh, just click the links. I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, you guys help me uh, get this done and I get by with a little help from my friends. So that's me in the top right. I'm Jim Lee, James Franklin Lee Jr., from Sumter, South Carolina. If you want to know more about me or get in contact with me, you can click this right here. Go to climateviewer.com slash about and uh, see, you know, where I've been cited all over the world uh, by scientists and global bodies. And my research is highly prized. So I, I did my best with this presentation to try to bring you just the facts. I hope that uh, this has been extremely informative. Um, I hope that you guys will spread this video around. Maybe you may need to go through it once or twice to watch the video again. Um, but know that the presentation will be available on climateviewer.com slash harp. There will also be an article um, posted on the front page. So you can just click right on that. Watch this video. Share it with others. Download the presentation or view the presentation itself. It's a PowerPoint presentation. So you're free to download that, turn it into a PDF, do whatever you like with it, send it to your uh, loved ones, senators, or uh, you know your favorite uh, troll who's just giving you hell for too far, far too long. Um, but just remember that there's a lot of information packed into this presentation, and with information comes power, and with power comes great responsibility. So please just remember if you're going to call up the people at Harp. Attack ideas, not people. And thank you for watching this presentation.